Yes. It's great to have you. Spiritual Sunday. We're here in Boca. Again, the power of, um, you know, the spiritual world precedes the physical world. So whatever we see in the physical world has to have come from and be patterned on the spiritual world. So as we talk about, and we'll talk a little more today about being one soul, that in spirituality there's really no time, space, or motion. So it took, um, let's call it 2,021 years for the scientists to come up with a way to show us physically that that's true. But here we are, we've got here a group in Boca, and then we have people all around the world, and we're here at the same time in the same place. Yes? So if we know that's true physically, what we want to do, what we're doing here in the center is to, how can we speed up the process? Because my teachers, the Rav and Karen, always mention, you know, they'd always say, Kabbalah's 50th century science, and the scientists are only in the, now the 21st century. So they're only about 3,000 years behind. So how do we speed up the process? How are we going to get the scientists to start catching up with what we know from the Zohar? Oh, I hear them. They're answering me out there in cyberspace, since nobody here wants to uh, answer. How do we do that? We speed up the spread of what we're doing here. Oops. Right? The faster we spread the wisdom of Kabbalah, the faster we get people to come, Kabbalah.com or streaming any of the classes we have, think, you raise the consciousness, you raise the consciousness, what happens to the energy out there? Suddenly you'll wake up some scientist who will say, wow, I just got this amazing idea how to do a World Wide Web or how to come up uh, like Einstein, came up with the theory of relativity a few years after Rav Ashlag wrote it in the Zohar, in his commentary. So always comes the spiritual and then the physical. So if we want to speed up, the transformation of the physical world to be more peaceful, more harmonious, with more love and kindness, then you and I are the ones who have to lead the way. We have to start acting on a spiritual level with greater love and kindness, etc. Okay, so let's read from Karen, Finding the Darkness, the Light Through the Darkness, and we open it up to this chapter called Make Room for God. That already should put a question in our mind. If God is infinite and God is all-powerful and almighty, what does it mean to make room for God? So she says like this, let's face it, we all judge. I think we spoke about judgment not too long ago. We take a look at people and we somehow make ourselves more by making others less. We do this by telling ourselves that they do things we would never do. Yet, if we lived the same way they do, if we went through what they went through, we might be a lot more like them. The problem with judgment is that it fills us up, and then we have no place for love. We get so full of ourselves, who we think we are, what we believe we are entitled to, that there is no space for others, and more importantly, there is no space for God. Spiritual work, as explained by the Kabbalist, is the work of developing ourselves to become like the Creator. When we behave as the light does, we actually bring light into our being. Rav Ashlag explains this understanding, explains that this understanding comes from the spiritual concept called similarity of form. And now she's quoting from the book On World Peace. Indeed, a closeness between spiritual bodies is a matter of similarity of form just as love is a similarity of form and opinions, while hate is the opposite. Consequently, the moment that you cancel the desire to receive within you, you bring your spiritual body closer to the Creator's, or to the Creator's essence, because you are totally in the aspect of sharing with others, which is the equivalent of giving pleasure to your Maker. This is the intention you want to fulfill, so that you will be prepared for the ultimate purpose of creation. When we are in affinity with the Creator, we can connect to His essence. God sees all of us with our imperfections and yet continues with infinite mercy and compassion to put breath and life in us. By opening up our hearts to care rather than our minds to judge, we expand our capacity for light. I have a favorite saying, this is Karen now, I have a favorite saying that has been attributed to many different authors. Nonetheless, for me, it is, a, is simply a wonderful reminder. 
You ready? There is so much good in the worst of us and so much bad in the best of us that it ill behooves any of us to find fault with the rest of us. Okay. So let's talk about making room for God. No, which actually will fit. We want to talk about, if you saw the Facebook post, maybe that's why some of you are here, soulmates. Yes, got to find my soulmate right? It's a drive. We have to find. We have to find. So I always tell the story when I was teaching in LA, you know, it's like one week you're meeting with a student and it's just, ah, oh, hi, I found my soulmate. He or she makes me feel so good. I don't touch the ground when I walk. I don't sleep. I don't eat. I don't this. I'm just so amazingly in love. Three weeks later, you meet the same student and now what do they tell you? No, no, no. They weren't really my soulmate. Can you just take that off the... Yeah. yeah. They weren't really my soulmate, but now I really found the right one. And then three weeks later, guess what? The same thing happens over and over and over again. Everybody looking for their soulmate. So we want to understand one, first and foremost, from the idea of Kabbalah, what is a soulmate? And then we want to understand how we might be able to use that idea in our life. So it goes like this. The Bible tells us, very simply, when the vessel, the soul that the Creator created in the endless world, when it came into this world, there was only one soul. The Creator couldn't make many souls, made one soul, we call it the vessel, filled with the light of God, and when it came into this world, it was in one ethereal body. So that's what we have to get back to. If it came in as one, then we have to go back to the endless world as one again. So how come we can look around the world, we can see 8 billion people on the planet. And we all say we have a soul, do we not? Exactly. So what is the difference between our soul and that one soul? So I like the idea for me, is like this. If I look at my fingers, if you see your fingers, and you put, I don't know, you know, some cover. Oh, you ever seen these, like these people, the, the, um, the little acts where they do black light stuff? So they're all dressed in black, and their hands are painted with fluorescent paint. So when you're watching them, all you see are like disembodied hands floating around. Yes? No? I can't yeah. tell if they're getting here. Are you guys getting it? Yeah. Okay. Right. So all you see. Now imagine if somebody didn't know, like we know, the arm, the hands connected to the arm, connected to the rest of the body. They would think they're really disembodied hands. So they would see that they were separate things. But you and I have come to understand, no, they're all part of one body. Those two hands related to one body. So then we understand the interconnectedness. So when that one soul came into the world as one body, what's the next thing we see in the Bible? Then it was split into Adam and Eve. So now there's two bodies that contain all of the energetically male and female souls. But our perception was there were two different people. So if you think like those black light actors or dancers, we know that Adam and Eve were one soul. So we would call them soulmates because they were one soul split in half. Now they're soulmates, meaning they're a perfect match. Yes? Then what happened? Then they had kids. Where did the kids come from? The kids came from Adam and Eve. So how do we understand that? A piece of that soul, like the fingers, just embodied itself in another body, but it's still connected as one soul. And then they started multiplying, multiplying, now we have eight billion bodies on the planet. You and I, here in the center, we keep emphasizing, though, what? We're still only one soul. There's still only one soul, we just have the appearance of being disembodied, separated by what? What separates you and me? Right now, here, in this room. Space. There's a distance between us. There's a distance between us. So the same thing, you have 8 billion people around the planet. What separates us? Space. But like we said in the beginning here, now thanks to technology, I don't want to say high technology because I think Kabbalah is the highest, but because of this technology, now we can be from all over the world, here in the same place in the same moment. So some of that space has been taken away. 
and we have now a greater closeness. In other words, 50 years ago or 60 years ago, those of you who are in Hawaii, those of you who are in Europe, those of you in different parts of America, those of you in, in Hong Kong, we would never be able to have this interconnection because space was too big. Now, physically, they're taking away aspects of space. And as we said, you and I need to keep that in our spiritual consciousness to take away more of the space that separates us. Okay, let that sink in a little bit. So, if we're 8 billion people, but we're one soul, the Kabbalists call it tikkun, or we might say our karma. What's our karma? What does it really mean? What's our purpose in this world? If we separate it from 1 into 8 billion, and we can only go back to the endless world as one, then what should we be thinking about? What should we be doing on a daily basis? Reuniting all the pieces, like a jigsaw puzzle, right? You open up the puzzle box. You know, we used to, we used to give it as one of the examples in class of what we call bread of shame, which I don't want to get into. If you, were, if you went to the store and you bought a puzzle and you want to make a jigsaw puzzle, anyone here ever made a jigsaw puzzle? Sure? One person. Okay, a few. You yeah, made a jigsaw puzzle. What's the fun of making a jigsaw puzzle? Putting, it together. Putting the pieces together. So if you open the box of this 5,000-piece jigsaw puzzle and all you pulled out of the box was essentially the puzzle, the, the 5,000 pieces, but they're already glued onto like one sheet and they're all put together and all you do is unfold it like a, like a sheet for your bed, would you be disappointed or would you be happy? No fun. no fun. Why? Because the fun is putting the pieces together. So in the same way the Kabbalists explain to us, our whole spiritual mission in this world is to bring the pieces back together. Take away the space between us and each other. Because in that space, what exists? Pain, suffering, chaos, confusion, disillusionment, all the negativity of the world exists in space. When we're united, there's no space. This is why they say, I forget who started it. I only remember it from Lincoln. A house divided cannot stand. Or they say in battle, divide and conquer. We've all heard those sayings. What makes it so difficult to live? Think about it. Any of you ever... ever Okay, let's go back a little bit just in case. In college, you ever seen friends move out of, in or out of the dorm rooms? Yes? So what's the easiest way to complete that task quickly? Do it by yourself? Get help. Assemble friends. The more friends you have working together in one mission, the faster things go. If you had ten friends and all of them were doing different things, it would delay the fact. You'd still be doing on your own, but now you'd be distracted because this one's carrying something over there, this one's carrying something to the wrong room, etc. Take you three times as long. So if you have a group that's working together and has one mission in mind, things will go a lot faster. So then let's start looking at some of the biblical examples of soulmates as people think about soulmates. So a few that we could talk about, Abraham and Sarah, the patriarch, Isaac and Rebecca. Jacob and Rachel, Rachel, and then my favorite is the Rav and Karen. And if you read Two Unlikely People, it's an amazing story. But all these people have things in common that we need to learn. Because if you're sitting here saying, yes, I got to find my soulmate, I want to find my soulmate, can't wait till I find my soulmate, how do I find my soulmate? Well, we need to figure out how did the people who did find their soulmates, what did they do? then you might not be so enthusiastic. So, simple terms. What did Abraham have to do to find his soulmate? And we'll just keep it simple. He had to overcome idolatry. He grew up in a family. His father was an idol maker, professed idolatry. So it was easy to say, well, you know, the whole environment taught him idolatry. So he had to overcome the idea that anything in the physical, material world was really God, meaning the source of all lasting fulfillment. He had to overcome that. You and I look and we say, if I had been there, like Karen wrote when we read Frank, 
If I was there, it'd be real easy. I don't believe that statue is God. Sure, but now we have 21st century idolatry. Could be a car, could be a computer, could be a, uh, what do they call it, a space capsule, could be all kinds of things. Think right now, objectively honest, is there something that you just thought of maybe earlier today or yesterday? If I only had this, I only did this, if I only got that, I'd be so happy. That's idolatry, my friends. Maybe not in the same way as we think, but it is a form of idolatry. Why? Because in that moment, in that frame, we said, this physical thing is my source of lasting fulfillment. Because how many of you would like to have joy and happiness for five minutes and then, heaven forbid, pain and suffering for the next 23 hours and, and uh, 55 minutes? Any of you? So then when a person says, if I had this, that, or the other thing, or did this, I'd be happy, they're not thinking just for five minutes, ten minutes. Temporarily, I want it forever. So then unconsciously, unaware, we've made that our God. Because God, as we talk about it, as we truly understand, is the source of lasting fulfillment forever. So anything less than that is a form of idolatry. So we have to start overcoming our form of idolatry. Then this week, if you're familiar with the idea of the portion of the week, this week we hear a nice story about Rebecca, the soulmate of Isaac, the patriarch. How did she get create the energy to attract or be attracted to Isaac, her soulmate. So read the story, and I almost thought of reading it directly out of the Bible, but I'll just cut to the chase. Eliezer, the, the servant of Abraham, was sent on a mission to find Isaac's match. So he goes, and here he sees this little girl among all the shepherds by the well. And this little girl sees the stranger, goes to the well, takes a jar of water, she carries it over to him and says, here, please drink this. You know, let me give you some water. Then let me get water for your camels. Then let me get water for all your, your people accompanying you. Then let me get water for all the, the camels that they're riding on. As we call it, sharing beyond logic. Okay, you say a nice thing. She gave, you know, Eliezer the water. Okay, great. No, she went far and beyond that. That kind of sharing. Jacob. What did Jacob do to, to finally match himself or to mate himself with, with Rachel? Fourteen years of hard labor in the employ, so to speak, of his to-be father-in-law, Lavan, the greatest, one of the greatest sorcerers that ever existed. Fourteen years of fighting the sorcery and all the negative energy and the negative influence, etc., How many of us would like to do that? It's funny, you know, in the last few weeks, I've had at least six people ask me about curses. What does Kabbalah say about people who have, you know, who curse you or, you know, want to curse you or put curses on the families and this, that, and the other thing? And I always go back to this simple thing that I've learned from my teachers. If there's an empty space, darkness will exist in that empty space. If you fill that space with light, darkness disappears and can never return. So the only way a person can be, quote, cursed is if they left themselves an opening. That's why what we read today, Karen said, make room for God. Because if we don't make room for God, then we've made space for all the chaos and the confusion. And then, of course, in my lifetime, we have the Rav and Karen, who 50 years ago, they were the only two people in the world to bring Kabbalah, this lineage of great Kabbalists, to the masses. And if you read the stories, they had to go through all kinds of trials and tribulations. In fact, in the beginning, when they first started to teach openly Kabbalah, somebody came and took a bat and hit Karen over the head, knocked her unconscious, and put her in the hospital. Why? What was, what was their crime? Teaching Kabbalah to somebody who wasn't religious, to anybody who wanted to come. And they fought that battle for years and years and years to bring it to us today. 
So when we really think about achieving whatever that level of soulmate means, we have to remember it means a lot of effort, a lot of overcoming, and a lot of transformation. But that goes with everything. Yeah, today we're talking about soulmates because it's a big thing. i got to find my soulmate, got to find my soulmate. But what about finding your right place in the business world? To have the right prosperity manifesting what the Creator gave us. To be in the right home, the right place, with the right friends. That's also an aspect of the effort we have to make. How many of you ever had a bad friend? Exactly. When you first met them or whatever, did they appear bad to you? No, they appeared good. That's why you were friends. And then all of a sudden, something came along, something happened, and all of a sudden you realize, no, they're not really my friend. Fairweather friend or whatever name you want to call it. They weren't. Well, how come? And this is the part, this is not going to be very pleasant, but it's extremely powerful. Because when we look in the mirror and we see ourselves not appearing spiritually or even physically as we would like to see, it's a shock, right? If you thought you were dressed to the nines and you got everything was great and it's all in alignment, etc., then you look in the mirror and suddenly you see something was backwards, something out of order, you know, the makeup isn't right, the hair, something like this. It's a little shock, no? It's a little painful. How much more when it comes to our spiritual vision of ourselves? When the light turns on and we start to realize, uh-uh, I still have too much ego, even though I thought I overcame it. I have too much guilt, although I thought I overcame it. It is a shock. But as I've shared with you my experience a few weeks ago, it's painful, but after you go through that momentary pain, it becomes the greatest mercy. Because then you will never go backwards to repeat those same mistakes. You will never go backwards. So here's a question for you. Those of you who are thinking you want your soulmate. Why? Why do you want your soulmate? Think about it. Why? What do you think you're going to get from them? What do you think it's going to do for you? What do you think it's going to do for you that you can't do on your own? Because as we said, you take these couples that we talked about, Abraham and Sarah, Isaac and Rebecca, the Rav and Karen, Jacob and Rachel. Not only was it work to find and to meet together and be together, but they also, if you look at them all, they had one mission in mind. How to make the world a better place. How to bring people to the light of the Creator. How to help them understand that they have the power of God inside them. And there's no one and nothing outside of them that can cause any chaos. As they'll let the light shine out of their soul. So it wasn't just... Isaac wanted to marry Rebecca because he was so madly in love and he saw that she was beautiful and this and this and they could have a great life. Travel the world, go on cruises, you know, have nice kids and things like that. No, that wasn't the purpose. You and I learn here in the center that our only purpose in this world is to find the proper vessel to share our light with. And if we can't find it, we've learned ways and means to actually make Every situation in our life, from our point of view, the proper vessel to share in the moment. So let's think, why do I want my soulmate? Have a big vision, happily ever after. Maybe my soulmate has more prestige than I do and I want that prestige. Maybe they have more whatever status and I want that. Ask, what are we looking for? Think we'll be happier? So a very nice story. Years ago, one of the students came to the Rav and said, Rav, I want the Rav to give me a blessing so I can find my soulmate because I want to be able to do my correction. I want to fulfill my mission in this world. You know, my life will be so much better. And the Rav, if you would, you know, some of you never had the chance to meet the Rav, but the Rav in his inimitable way looked at me and said, you know, my teacher didn't marry his soulmate but he finished his tikkun. He was happy all his life. So sometimes we kind of put on our soulmate, well, if I found my soulmate, I could do my job, I could finish my tikkun, everything would be great and wonderful. No, we have to remember, tikkun means what? Tikkun, for those of you unfamiliar, tikkun in Hebrew means correction, like karma. 
What does it mean to correct? The space between us. Think back to a, a, even a, fam a family relationship. You were friends, close, loved ones, etc. And then something happened and we say, we created distance. Right? Suddenly, they could be living in the same house. But whatever conflict, whatever discord, we created distance between us. Yes? You can relate? No, nobody has distance between you and somebody else. And yet you could be in the same room. So what does the distance mean? We put some veil between us and them. Fear, anger, animosity, resentment, guilt, shame, jealousy, whatever it may be. We put that space, which is what? We covered our soul. We don't let the light come out. And therefore, darkness takes that space. And we feel distant because they're on the other side of that darkness. But if you think about it, where are we? If, if we put space between us, darkness, and there's other people on the side, but we say, no, those are the people who did this, that, or the other thing. What do we do to ourselves? Yeah, we immersed ourselves in darkness. Right? It's like somebody in, in class the other day was asking, you know, what about when you guard your heart because you don't want to be hurt? You don't want to feel vulnerable and have people step all over your heart. So I explained to them what I've come to not only understand here with the brain, but experience with my heart. Took me, I don't know if I'm, took me 30 years in the center to come to the clarity. You protect your heart because you got hurt once, twice, or three times. So you build walls around your heart, yes? So nobody now can hurt you. But what we don't realize is what did we do to our own heart? We imprisoned it. We put it in prison. So yeah, they can't get in, but we can't get out either. And then you wonder why, while you're in prison, protecting your heart, you don't feel loved. Nobody wants to love you. You can't attract love in your life. Well, hello, you put it in prison. You put steel bars between you, space between you and that person who is ready to love you who gives you an opportunity to express and manifest your love and your sharing towards them. Not just, I can't get. No, but I can't share it either. Because why does it bother us? Why does it bother a person, now if you're following this, why does it bother the person who's in that jail, protected their heart? Why does it bother them that nobody loves them? That nobody's around them? Because we feel inside of us the love that's there, but it's not being manifest. We have no one to love. So then all the love that's inside of us is not being expressed. And if it's not expressed, we don't experience it. We don't have the joy of it. The same with everything else. I haven't used it in a while. So, and again, because we can take it to all the other areas of our life. So in business, I have people that I know that many, many years ago, they basically put their let's call it their business energy, also in a prison. What was the prison? They get in a job, and within the first few months, suddenly everybody around them is an idiot. They don't know what they're doing. They're foolish and stupid. So they kind of put themselves in that prison, and they leave. They go to another job. And then six months later, it's the same thing again. And it happened at least a dozen times to one person I know. The same thing, different jobs, different places, but everybody else was an idiot. So if you think about it, they imprisoned their business energy, soul energy, so that they had no place they could express what God put inside them to make it manifest and have the joy and the sense of prosperity. Did they make money in each job? Sure, they got a paycheck. But they didn't have the blessing of it. They didn't enjoy it. Why? Because they were so miserable that everybody else was an idiot. But they imprisoned themselves. Our work is to take the light that God put inside of us and express it out. Love, kindness, forgiveness, generosity, compassion. Because only when it's expressed do we feel the joy and the fulfillment and the accomplishment and the serenity and the peace of it. This is why we're all driven, either by desire to share or by the pain and suffering of not experiencing all the joy and the peace and the harmony and the prosperity that we feel inside of us we're supposed to have. So now when it comes to why do I want, 
Why am I looking for my soulmate? And I say to myself, well, because I'll just be happy. Really? Is that the only way we could be happy? If we come back to the thought, God already put inside of us happiness, and it's our job to express it, so we'll have the experience of happiness, then I don't need a soulmate to do that. I can look around me. I can drive down the street. Walk down the street, smile at somebody who's got a frown on their face. You ever done that? Okay, say yes, so they can hear you around the world. Yes, we've done that. So when you smile at that person who's got a frown on their face, you don't know them. But when they turn to you and they smile back, really, how do you feel? You feel good. You feel happy. I made somebody's day. Is it like, we think, well, it's a little thing. But do you know in that moment you transform the entire world? Kabbalistically. Because everybody, ourselves, we are a world of 8 billion parts to ourselves. They, that person you smiled at, they are also, from their point of view, a world of 8 billion pieces to themselves. So when we smiled, we enlightened our 8 billion pieces. When they smiled, they changed from the sad and influencing those people in their 8 billion pieces with a little bit of negativity. They change it suddenly influencing them with light, happiness, and joy. So we have to come to understand how much power we have to transform the world. Literally the world. But we don't believe it. We don't believe it. Every time I was telling somebody the other day, as now, I just threw it out there, we are a world to ourselves. From my point of view, think. From my point of view, as I look out at the world, I'm seeing from my consciousness, 8 billion people. And I will assess, hopefully not judge in the negative way, but at least assess what I perceive in those people. Is it somebody that I feel right now I want to have physically close in my life, whatever, or not? I can still connect to the light in their soul. I can still send them light. I can still feel and live as I'm one soul with the light of God in their soul and still keep them physically at a distance because right now they're not letting enough of that light out that I want to be around, that I want that in my environment. But for my sake, I have to enlighten and connect to those 8 billion parts of me. So when you look out, you're looking at people from the same thing, from your consciousness, from the way you're thinking now. How do you know this is true? Because I always like to give, especially if you're newer, some evidence of it. So think of the last time you went to a movie with a group of friends. You all saw the same movie. Did you all agree that it was a great movie or a bad movie? Or did some say good and some say bad? Has it never happened to you that some say good and some say bad, some liked and some... But you all watch the same movie. How come not everybody had the same opinion of it? Because we see it from our own eyes. There was a movie years ago, just after my mom died of cancer, and I, as I've shared with you, I started to move out of the direction of medicine into the direction of spirituality. Terms of Endearment. A movie about a woman dying of cancer. Academy Awards. So people tell me, Chaim, you've got to go see the movie. Right? Great movie, this and that. I said, look, I just lived through it. Why in the world do I have to go to a movie to see it? Not my cup of tea, and for sure back then, there was no way I was going to see it because I was still caught up in this pain and this grief of my mom dying of cancer. But a lot of people loved the movie. Okay, I don't have judgment on them. They loved it. That was their consciousness. But I was in the frame of that time, having just lost my mom, and so I had no affinity with the movie. No thank you. So we all have aspects of that, right? A person having a tough time in business. You think they're going to love to go see movies about everybody making so much money and, you know, easy, the money coming to them easy and, you know, people just giving them or in here? No, it's not going to be quite, right, as attractive. You follow the idea? So we all see from our consciousness. In the ultimate, yes, God gave us 100%. We have a pure and perfect light beingness and consciousness. But what we could call our current consciousness is a mix. It's the mix of how much of God's light I've let out through love, kindness, co compassion, forgiveness, etc., and how much I've covered it up with jealousy, ego, fear, guilt, shame, anger, whatever. That's who I am now. 
So let's say there's a person who's at 60-40. However it come about, they're shining 60% of God's light out into the world. 40% is blocked. They have the potential. It's inside them waiting to get out, but it's blocked. So they're at a 60-40 consciousness. Yes? If we hold the thought that everything is exactly cause and effect, and they're putting out only 60%, and 40% is their negativity, right, the light that's blocked, then what do you think they're going to attract? They're going to attract friends that are 60% friends, 40% fair weather friends, or things like that. They're, gonna, they're going to attract a business deal that's 60-40. They're going to attract health issues, 60-40. Everything's going to be 60-40. When you can raise yourself to 70-30, guess what will magically happen? Suddenly your life will be 70-30. A little happier, better friends, a little more prosperity, greater health, more peace of mind, etc. Cause and effect, like attracts like. This is why we have to understand when we talked about soulmates, yes, to ultimately get to soulmates, a lot of work. A lot of work. We have to reach whatever that level is to truly merit our soulmate. And then I just heard, again, cause and effect. So this morning, in preparing for this, I happened to turn on one of Karen's lectures from this week's energy, Chaya Sarah, a few years ago. And Karen's mentioning, which we often speak about when we give classes on relationships or soulmates, Isaac, think. Think the last time you fell in love with somebody. Maybe it's somebody who's currently with you, maybe it's not. But you fell in love, then you fell out of love. So what does the Bible teach us with Isaac and Rebecca? He saw her. He married her. Then he loved her. We say, sounds bad. Oh, well, it's the Bible. <laughs> you know, the Bible and all that stuff. Who believes all the Bible stuff? No, it's a lesson for us. And as Karen shared, she said, what do most people do? And it may be us, may not be, but let's think about it. Most people find somebody attractive, and then... they take that attraction into a physical level. And then they're in love. But as we come to understand, and as our experience can show us, when it all falls apart, it's why? Because once we become physically intimate, there's blinders come up. Because as we learn from the story of Adam and Eve, as we all probably experienced, that kind of connection is extremely powerful. Extremely powerful. In its simplest terms, it's the only thing in the universe that will bring a human soul into this world. So it's got to be very powerful. So if it's used not in the right order, let's call it, this is what Karen was saying. We're usually backwards. So we learned from Isaac. He saw her. He married her. And once there's a true bonding, and let's say that true, true inner commitment to share with each other, to unite two people, to be able to do exponentially more good for the world than the two could individually, then there's love. Because we know Kabbalistically, love means unity, oneness. And if there's no bonding of those souls through this commitment we call marriage, Kabbalistically, the, the, the process, to like glue the souls together, then like we see today, and in fact, most people will quote, what happens today? People get married 50-50, 50% divorce, 50% kind of hang on for a while. Why? Because if you were to take two pieces of paper and you just hold them together, they'll stay together as long as you hold them, yes? As soon as you let go, they'll fall apart. But if you glue them together, and then you let go of them, wherever they fall, they're still together. So what they're teaching us is, once we've truly bonded, we see there's a soul connection, we bond on a soul level, then we can use that match to take away more of our curtains and veils. Even Kabbalistically, read to unlikely people, the Rav and Karen. They knew they, knew they could see on their, in their 
level, they were able to see they were soulmates. But if you read the book, when they first came together, yeah, they committed. They did the process of gluing Kabbalistically. But if you read the first couple years, not in a one against the other way, but they were like sandpaper. You know, like if you want to make something really smooth and join it together perfectly, you got to sand down all the little splinters. So for the first couple of years, there was that process. But it wasn't about he and she. It was about how do they get their souls closer so they will be able to unite and what they've ultimately done, bring Kabbalah to the world, literally to the world. But they're still standing. There's no happily ever after that way. You get married, your soulmate, and that's it. No, then comes even the harder work because you've got to take away all those splinters. So we want to understand, yes, it's great soulmates, but also realize you have soulmate friends, you have soulmate businesses, you have soulmate health, you have soulmate protection. We want to be protected. How come some people can drive down the street, get in a car accident? Some people, you know, drive out of the parking lot and hit the pole, back into another car, all those things. So this, I hope, will really shake you up a little bit. But shake you into an awakening of awareness. Those are also soul mating incidences. Person bumps into, you know, another car in the parking lot or into one of the, you know, uh, concrete poles, things like that, scrapes against, you know, the wall in their driveway. That's also a soul mate. Hmm, what does that mean? We just said, if a person's at 60-40, now there's God gave us 100%, yes, but if a person only revealing 60-40, that means in some way, shape, or form, there have to be 40% of their life, some form of challenge to help them remove the covers from that 40% of their soul that's not being revealed. And as we teach from Kabbalah 1 forward, every challenge Every difficult situation is an opportunity from our side to reveal more light by breaking through that veil, whatever the veil is, judgment, fear, ego, doesn't matter, whatever it is, and move to 70-30 and 80-20. So we are constantly in a soul match because it is, as we read from Karen, similarity of form. She quoted Rav Ashlag in On World Peace, like attracts like. So, I also offer you, look back on some of the difficult situations in your life that you've gone through. Make an effort to look with Kabbalistic eyes and see if it wasn't really, as you looked back on it, even though it was painful, maybe very difficult, etc., but from your inner perspective, now with your Kabbalistic understanding of purpose in this world, the tikkun process, etc., look back and see how it was exactly what you needed in the moment you needed. That in overcoming it, going through it, pushing yourself to not only survive but to thrive through it, it actually enhanced and maybe sped up your spiritual process, your spiritual evolution. Again, not always easy, often very painful. Yet at the same time, it was part of that spiritual evolution. So there is, in essence, nothing that's not a soul match. In fact, I had a conversation with somebody yesterday, in fact, who's going through challenging relationship in the process of divorce, married for a number of years, and came to realize that that person, even though they're now divorcing, that person was a soul match for who they were in the beginning of their relationship. They have since grown. They have since broken through a lot of their klipot, their veils and curtains. So they realize now they're no longer a match on a soul level. But they came to understand, yes, in that moment, when they were first got together, they were on a match, a soul match, because their level of consciousness matched the other person's. Those friends who've left you or you've left them, think back to the first time you met them. There was an affinity. You enjoyed the party. You enjoyed certain things. You liked the same hobbies. There was an affinity. You can't say there wasn't. Otherwise, why were you friends? What attracted you to each other? Same thing with a job. How many people, and I know, again, it's 
Not always an easy situation. How many people take a job because it pays the bills? Probably all of us at some point, we took a job, paid the bills. We didn't like the job. We didn't really like what we we're doing, but it paid the bills. Where was our consciousness? Pay the bills. Is that lasting fulfillment? Is that really the highest and best? Is that manifesting what the Creator gave us? No. So the job probably didn't last. Either that or it became so frustrating that we left it. Either way, it didn't last. But it was a match of our consciousness. It reflected who we were and where we were in the moment. So we come to understand here, and I want to put this out for all of you. We are a world to ourselves, and our world, my world, reflects my consciousness. So if I'm driving down the street, and somebody on the street cuts me off or this, that, or other thing, and pushes my button, and I can pause, and instead of getting angry and scream at them, I can pause and say, you know, I send you light to be protected as you drive down the street. So for me, I broke through some of that veil, some of that curtain of anger. More light shining out of me, let's say I went from 60 to 70. Then when I arrive at my destination, whether it's at the store, a friend's house, my own home, business, wherever it is, I am now at 70 and 30. So the light of 70 now will be revealed in that other frame of my life, not just on the street. I'll go to work and suddenly now there's 70% light. I see things better, it's clearer to me, I attract more abundance and prosperity, better co-workers, better bosses, better employees, etc. Don't look to the specific area you make a breakthrough and say that's where the result has to come from. No, because we are a world to ourselves. So every breakthrough we make, it will apply different places in our life. That's the part we've learned to leave to our soul. Leave to the bigger picture within us. I make a breakthrough at work, overcomes whatever, some jealousy, some hurt at work, it may show up as better health. Because light will find a way to manifest. I can't tell the light how to manifest because I'm not smart enough to do that. I don't know what I need. You think every person who drove down the street today and got in a car accident woke up and left their house in their car and said, ah, they're going to get in an accident today. No, they didn't expect it. It happened. So when we can reveal light, sometimes that light will take away the car accident. Sometimes it will take away bad health. Sometimes it will take away bad friends. Leave the light to do its job. Our job is to remember we have the most amazing, magical power of the Creator inside of us. I mean, think, the light of God that brought the whole universe into physical existence and maintains it. The Kabbalists teach, even though you look, let's say, this physical book, the book was printed, it's made out of you know, trees, paper, etc. So we say it has a life. But the Kabbalists say, no, don't you ever forget that microsecond to microsecond, the only thing that keeps this book still in one piece is the light of God that's infused in it microsecond by microsecond. If the light of God disappeared from this book, it would disintegrate instantly. If the light of God disappeared from a person, they would disintegrate instantly. The only thing that keeps us going is the light of God. So imagine, we have that power within us. Don't let that opponent, that competitor in your head, make you believe you are powerless over anything. Because the light of God in us has power over any and everything, over all forms of darkness. You look at the world today, how many people do you know are discouraged? What's going on in the world? What's going to happen? I don't know. I'm more scared than ever. There's so much chaos, so much discord. No or yes? yes. Yeah. What are we going to do about it? Hello, look inside us. We have the light of God that can take away darkness from the entire universe. You don't think the light of God can make awakening people more love, kindness, and compassion, more forgiveness and tolerance? It's done it for us. That's why we're here. That's why we're learning here in the center. So if we awaken, or as we awaken the light in others, it's going to do the same thing for them. We have magical power. Just be careful. Don't think your magical power gives you the ability to say, okay, I'm going to send them light, and then they're going to do what I want them to do. They're going to do what God inside them directs them to do, which in the big picture is harmonious for all of us. It takes us to the same place. The only two things that are predestined that we have literally no choice over 
that we dropped out of the endless world created by God, and we will get back to the endless world through heaven on earth. That we have no choice. That's predestined. That every human being on earth will live shortly in the Garden of Eden, heaven on earth. Where our free will comes in is how fast we can bring the Garden of Eden before the Kabbalistic deadline and how much pain and suffering a person has to go through to learn the lesson that they have God inside them and our job is just to let it shine, let it out, let it shine and take away the darkness. Light will take away the darkness. I don't know how it happens, but I know it does. So don't try and be smart. I'll figure out. Because if you look back in the last three, 4,000 years of history, how many smart people still couldn't figure out how to make the world a better place. But you and I know that God inside us and inside them can do it. So if we start waking up and we see there is so much darkness in the world, but remember that we have the infinite, magical, light power of God inside of us. And as we will act in ways to let more of it shine out, then not only will we start to take away the dark clouds that have hidden our pieces of Garden of Eden, but as we do that, think about it. All the people in the world, when they see us living in more and more of the Garden of Eden, what do you think they're going to want? They're going to want also to get out of their hellish existence into more of their Garden of Eden. And how are they going to do that? The same way we do it. Let more of our light shine. Greater compassion and kindness and forgiveness. And then sort of we, we will lead the world to kind of paraphrase the song. We're going to lead the world to such a place that peace will fill the planet because love will guide each and every one of us. God bless. Thank you. So, as we do every week, one, I just want to thank you all for supporting the program, supporting the center, because the faster we can spread all of the various things that we do here, the wisdom of Kabbalah and spreading the Zohar, the faster we will be able to bring people into that unity. As we said, it's about bringing people into oneness. We divided eight billion, we want to start gluing people together. You and I are already gluing together because we're here with one objective bringing people to this wisdom, making sure there's more and more light going out into the world. So with your help, with your support, we're able to do that. And that's why at this point, whether you're here or you're out there, I'm going to put, where are we? Okay, here. I'm going to put the, the giving link. So those of you, do the meditation with us, and then please go on the link, share whatever you're able to share with the consciousness that we're awakening now, to spread the light because we are all one soul. So if you're here or you're there, just holding your offering in your hand. And just feeling a greater sense of gratitude. Just consciously reach inside your soul, feel the light of God that's there. Perceive the light of God that's there. Acknowledge the pure and perfect light of God that fills our soul 100%. And let's together reach in and bring more of that light that has been covered up for years and maybe lifetimes. Let's draw it out into the world. Let's inject into this offering our gratitude, our light, our blessing, and our love, acknowledging the oneness of humanity that awakens a stronger, more intense desire to bring all the parts of our being, all the parts of humanity, into one team, one unit, one soul, and knowing that the light we share through these various projects in the center is removing the clouds of darkness individually and collectively, giving us the ability to see with greater clarity how to move forward in life so that we have greater joy and happiness 
true lasting fulfillment. The right words, the right actions to do, to speak towards others, to reach into their heart and soul and help them be free from their prisons. And that by spreading this wisdom and the books of the Zohar, we are sending out into the world greater and stronger spiritual glue to rebond all the souls of humanity, the pure and perfect parts of us and them, back into complete oneness. And so with gratitude for all the creators given us that allows us to have these resources, we share it, pay it forward to help others have the same, knowing that it will go through them, bless them, help them evolve spiritually, and then go out into the cosmos and return to us in the right time, in the right way, through the right people, in the right moments. And together we say, Amen. So thank you all for joining us. Thank you for those who are here physically and those who are online. And uh, have a blessed week. And again, remember, send me, you're on Facebook, send me your um, questions, send me your transformation, your miracles. And um, remember to share the video. And hopefully not too long from now, once we finish here, I'm going to post this video on the uh, Spiritual Sunday YouTube channel. Because I know a lot of people have been telling me their friends don't go on Facebook anymore, et cetera, et cetera, but they'll go on YouTube. So I'm making the greater effort to put this video also sometime today on the YouTube channel. So they'll be able to see this week's. Okay, thank you, have a great week. Love and blessings to all of you. Thank you for joining us. If you liked what you saw, subscribe to this channel that you'll be notified when we post new videos. Share the video with your friends, they can also benefit. And check out the website, www.kabbalah.com, that's K-A-B-B-A-L-A-H, for hundreds of articles and classes. Wish you an amazing day, and God bless.